All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. Together with my guests on this podcast, I go on a journey to discover how our current financial system works, why it's flawed and why Bitcoin is the most relevant technology that you should understand and adopt. In this episode, I'm joined by Zach Gennard. He runs Education for Thea, a Y Combinator backed startup providing the world's simplest Bitcoin multi-sig and self-custody service. He's also a student of economics at the University of Victoria and a prolific writer with his own publication, The Bitconomist on Substack. Welcome, Zach. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. I, uh, I, enjoy, uh, I enjoyed your writing. And uh, one of the goals with this podcast is to just have lots of different Bitcoiners on and hear about you know, their learnings and, and in your case, your writings. And uh, yeah, man, I'm, I'm super happy you, you're here. Like I, uh, I would love to talk about like one of the articles you wrote, which is about you know, breaking down b- myths around Bitcoin. But first, I wanted to ask you, like, which generation do you belong to? Because I think you're quite a bit younger than me. Yeah, so I am part of Gen Z, uh, one of the older people in this generation. So I think it spans from like 97 to to the 2010s or so. Um, okay. Yeah. And do you find it hard to like help your generation understand Bitcoin? I think there are uh, positive and negatives to it. Um, so one of the things that makes Bitcoin much more accessible to our, to my generation is the fact that we've grown up in a very digitally native way. Um, so we, um, we witness the advent of, of most of the largest social media companies, um, as well as just basically the digitization of, of everything from our photos to writing, you know, to emails, to, to movies, to TV, to music, everything is now just, uh, within reach on our smartphones. So from that perspective, um, Bitcoin, I think, uh, is, relatively easy to understand. Um, but even still, I think there's a big barrier around education, um, especially in Canada. Uh, I can speak from experience in the in the public education system here that we don't really learn at all about, we don't really get any financial literacy. We don't learn about finance or economics. Um, and even if you get to the university level, it's something you really only learn about if you are choosing to study uh, a degree related, related to these fields. Um, so, yeah, it's a little, it's a little, it's difficult, but it's also like the, there are, there are, uh, there's, yeah, we, we, we have a certain amount of, um, knowledge already that, that does help. Yeah. 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 What I find interesting is that like for my generation, I think what people, and and this was one of the fl- things when it also really clicked for me, how special Bitcoin is that, you know, you can actually own something which is digital, but through its nature, like how it's engineered, it, it's actually almost, I, I say physical or tangible, right? The fact that that digital thing you own, you know, one bit, one Bitcoin, for example, is actually in your possession. It's not stored anywhere or whatever. Just because you have access to it with your private key, it's verifiably yours. And because you can store it in your head, uh, that's when I call it tangible, right? But I think that's where most people kind of like have a, a cutoff in understanding if that makes sense right because every, everything we know up until now and i think also for your generation it's like yeah digital like everything can be copied everything can be shared it's like an infinite uh way of doing so like uh, how do you look at that like would you also say it's tangible or what uh, what what's the word you use yeah um i would agree with you there it, it's kind of strikes this this weird balance where it's both digital in nature, but also has tangible qualities and exists kind of in the physical world, both through uh, the way new Bitcoins are created with Bitcoin mining, but also through the way that uh, we store our seed phrases. So when you, you know, you open a Bitcoin wallet and you get those 12 words and those represent your Bitcoin, and that's a physical representation of your Bitcoin. And and, and those mm-hmm. words are what give you access to it. So it definitely has um, both these tangible and digital qualities and it kind of takes the best the best of both worlds almost yeah it's actually interesting when you say like you let's say you write down those words right that's like the access key to your bitcoin i kind of have like this uh cashier's check feeling right like because it's it, it could be like a very it, it's like a very viable code right you could have it like written down um and then you could check online or just digitally you can check if you actually if that code actually gives access to you know a bitcoin so 
I'm going to start using that, actually. Like, I, th I think that's great. Because that's not with any other things, right? That's not with digital photos. It's not with music or, any, like, you cannot verify that ownership. Yeah, you can show it on your computer, but then you always have to take your computer, right? Mm. Okay, let's, uh, I'll, totally. I'll think about that. That's, uh, that's fun. <laughs> um, yeah, so you wrote an article called Bitcoin Myths and Breaking Down the Most Common uh, Misconceptions. I would love to go like through it, but what made you like what inspired you to, to to write the article? Yeah, totally. Well, I was mostly inspired to write that article because I think Bitcoin is something that everyone has heard about at this point, especially over the last couple of years uh, over the, during the pandemic and things like that. We kind of like it was almost like a, a leap forward in the digital nature of everything that we're doing. You know, people went online to 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 do work through zoom and things like that. And then Bitcoin really broke onto the scenes for, for the, for more like mainstream public. Um, and so given that that had happened, everyone kind of knows what Bitcoin is, but I think very few people have actually taken the time to research it, like beyond kind of just what the narrative is around like media, what they say about Bitcoin or what political figures are saying about Bitcoin. And I think it's really important to, research it on your own and, and come to your own conclusions. And so that was kind of one of the reasons I wrote this article, because there's a lot of narratives around Bitcoin that are simply not true uh, and are a result of the fact that um, people haven't done enough research to understand how Bitcoin works. And so that's why I often say that I think Bitcoin is one of the most misunderstood technologies of our time. Yeah, I think so, too. I, I, I think I once tweeted something like if you're if you're really progressive and care like about the environment, you should definitely research Bitcoin, you know, like it's just absolutely, I find, I find it so interesting that especially that side, there's no one who is like an outspoken, let's say environmentalist, uh, besides maybe Daniel Batten on, on, on Twitter, you know, who is talking uh, about this. And, um, and, and I fully agree with, with what you say, like, it's hard to understand Bitcoin, but I think there's so many yeah, there's so many people with very strong opinions, but they are kind of loosely held in a sense that, um, well, I don't know if you ever encountered like a legitimate Bitcoin counter argument. Uh, we can talk about that later, but I, I find it very hard to actually find them, right? Like it's more feelings or, you know, these these simple thoughts, like how, how do you see that? And I, and I think it's actually bad, right? Like it it fuels skepticism and, and, and also adoption while you know, you, me, and, and lots of other people know that this is a a revolutionary thing in a sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we're kind of living in this age where like uh, opinions and beliefs have kind of become almost as relevant as, as like cold, hard facts. And I, I don't really know how that happened, but um, Tell me neither. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I definitely wild. noticed it as well. Um, and it, it's definitely a big problem because it, it fosters misinformation and false narratives about things that actually can be uh, really helpful to the world like Bitcoin. Yeah. All right. So the first one that you that you talk about is Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme. I love I love that when people tell tell that to me on on Twitter. Um, how how does how does Bitcoin set itself apart from Ponzi schemes? You you talk about like open source um, nature, transparency, the open, you know, the full accessibility, basically. Um, yeah. How would you uh, bust the Bitcoin is a Ponzi myth? Yeah, totally. Um, so I think it's important to understand like what, what a Ponzi scheme is. So a Ponzi scheme is a sort of a, is an investment scheme where basically um, new money is taken from, from new investors coming into the investment scheme and it's funneled up to other investors and uh, some of them keep a little bit of money for themselves. Um, and these sorts of schemes, they rely a lot on secrecy to obfuscate the fraud that they're committing. Uh, so they're, they're not open at all in nature. Um, and they often make promises of things like high returns and little risk. Um, and so when you, when you take into these account, into these, these factors of, of what a Ponzi scheme is, um, and then you look at what Bitcoin is, you can see that they are very distinctly different. So where, it where does a Ponzi sound scheme... the same sometimes, <laughs> right? Like because when people say like Bitcoin is the future, it's going up forever, etc. Like, I well, you know these could be the same words used by people in a Ponzi scheme in a sense, right? Yes, I hear what you're saying there, but I think I think we get sometimes people get a little carried away, um, as with any investment. Uh, 
Bitcoin has the potential for very high returns, but it's also accompanied by the possibility of financial loss. I think that that is just a, how investing works. Um, mm -hmm. And as much as I'm very confident in the future of Bitcoin, um, nobody knows the future exactly. So you probably shouldn't trust anybody telling you that. Um, <laughs> but also, uh, um, so for example, uh, Ponzi schemes also tend to benefit insiders, right? So Bitcoin contradicts that notion very heavily because when Bitcoin came onto the scene in 2009, um, it was not initially distributed to insiders or anything like that. Uh, right from the get-go, it was open to anyone. They, anyone could mine Bitcoin and obtain some coins for themselves. Ultimately, who got to do that or not was based on just who was paying enough attention or who heard about it. Um, so it's a very fair and inclusive launch. Whereas with, with Ponzi schemes, you would have money coming in favoring insiders. And then when those, those insiders cash out of that investment scheme, that, ten, that tends to collapse, um, yeah. which again, uh, I think Bitcoin kind of contradicts that as well, because we've seen for almost 15 years now, uh, Bitcoin's gone through market cycles, it's gone through ups and downs, but it continuously recovers and makes a new all time high. And I think that's sort of reflecting the the growing strength and resilience of, of the underlying network. Um, and then finally, of course, uh, Ponzi schemes rely on a lot of secrecy. They, they don't want you to know what's exactly happening to the money behind the scenes. They're just saying, give me your money and I will invest it and get you really high returns. With Bitcoin, yeah. um, it is it is very transparent. So in, in two different ways. One is that uh, it's open source code. So anyone can verify um, the Bitcoin code itself, verify the code that you're running when you run a node. Uh, and then as well, uh, the the Bitcoin blockchain is is an immutable, transparent ledger of, of all the Bitcoin transactions that have ever happened. So the idea that it it, it is in no way uh, like secretive. Um, it's very very open. It's open yeah, to, it's, to that's scrutiny actually and analysis. The entire point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the entire yeah. point, right? Yeah, yeah. But why do you think people say that? Like, I I I get it in replies. I think I think people focus more on like the investment part quote unquote of it right that you can actually buy it and then when someone well i say to someone like uh, uh i don't want to talk about the value going up or something and then then they kind of throw this in right like uh, yeah you you just want the next sucker to buy it or something like but it's also kind of where that stops right like the definitions that you just gave I, i've never seen a company uh, you know this uh, this argument being uh, accompanied with right um yeah. Yeah, so perhaps it's kind of a, an education thing in a sense on yeah. both sides of the subjects that we're talking about. I think there's something to be said about like uh, possibly the way that a lot of people promote Bitcoin. Uh, like it invokes a lot of passion in individuals um, and that can result in people just being very forward about it. Um, and yeah. I think that that forwardness can also kind of come off as like, this is a little, this seems fake, this seems too good to be yeah. true or, or whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, and the truth is it's not too good to be true. It actually is. It's true. And it's that good, <laughs> which is, <laughs> yeah. which is totally crazy. Um, but, but well, that's kind also, of what you realize when you've looked into it more. Yeah, I agree. I think it also is kind of like, I, I, I think this episode is going to be really good but that we talk about this. And what I think is interesting is that I now think it should invoke something in you when you hear someone so passionately talk about anything in general, right? If someone says like, okay, I don't know, sometimes I take myself as, a, as an example, like, I I don't know, I spent the ten last 10 years on and off learning about this, right? Is it 10,000 hours? I don't know, probably more, you know? And when I encounter people who I know have been spending more time, but also have, for example, a certain career in finance or something, you know, and they say like, well, uh, I mentioned Greg Foss a lot, right? He says, well, I've been 35 years in the risk chair. I've seen all these things. Bitcoin is the best asset that I've ever come across, right? Like that sparks something in me where I think like, okay, I want to understand why this guy, you know, with this track record says something like this, you know, instead of thinking, well, he must be talking shit or supporting a Ponzi in a sense. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, the next myth is Bitcoin is too volatile to function as money, right? Um, and you argue that the volatility is, is a natural aspect of price discovery, right? People are, are investigating what could this be worth? Um, 
and you also mentioned the term monetization. I read that before. Maybe you can explain that, like what that actually means. I think as it as it is getting valued, I would say something something like that. That's what yeah. would be my explainer <laughs> right now. Um, yeah. So so what is this, and and yeah, what will lead to a reduction in volatility, or will it stay like this? Totally. So yeah, I, I think I'd love to start by just saying like um, the idea that that Bitcoin is volatile. Um, I can understand that people would be turned off by that as an investment. Most people don't want to see the the fluctuation of their wealth to to, to sweat it to quite a large degree. Um, but I think it's also important to recognize that volatility is not an intrinsic characteristic of Bitcoin as a technology, but rather a reflection of its young and evolving nature. The fact that it is a truly free market. Um, and also the fact that there's a lot of speculation in the Bitcoin space because it's such a new technology. So often these these price corrections where we see massive run-ups in price and, and then massive crashes is also driven by people over leveraging and, and leveraging long or leveraging short uh, on either direction, which causes much more violent um, price fluctuations in Bitcoin. But it's not necessarily a part of what Bitcoin is. Um, mm -hmm. And if we look at... Um, one of the reasons I think people are also really turned off by this is because is the idea that that the volatility is kind of um, part of the, the price discoveries phase of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is undergoing monetization as we speak. The market is trying to figure out how to properly price Bitcoin. What is it? What is its equilibrium value? Um, and and I can understand why people find that kind of off putting because no one alive today has actually ever witnessed the real time monetization of a good. So really this like the last time this would have happened was probably with with gold. Um, and obviously no one alive today witnessed gold become money, whereas we are actually witnessing in real time Bitcoin becoming a dominant medium of exchange in the world, um, which I think is, is really cool. Um, and that's also part of why it, it is so volatile. Um, and then also, I think it's also important to recognize that while Bitcoin is volatile, it experiences strong price fluctuations. Um, it is consistently recovered and reached a new all time high. Uh, so I think it's more accurately characterized as being like upward volatility. So even though it is changing in price a lot, uh, it continues to go up in value. Um, and then additionally, um, volatility in Bitcoin has been decreasing over time. So if you, you can look at the Bitcoin volatility index and it basically measures the the um, the standard deviation of of, of moves in the, in the price of Bitcoin over time. And you can see uh, over its 14 year existence, it has significantly decreased in volatility. Um, and I think this is a reflection of the fact that the market is maturing. Um, there is growing liquidity in Bitcoin. There's a growing investor base. And these things are contributing to the maturation of Bitcoin as an asset and that decreasing in the decreasing volatility. Um, so I think as as time goes forward, as more investors come to the Bitcoin network, as liquidity grows, um, we're probably going to see volatility uh, decrease even further. Um, yeah. Yeah, I very, very good points. I think the point about this is something none of us has ever witnessed before i think is a is a very good point i have not thought about that before i i actually it's not not along the same lines but what i think is that people don't know like um at what timeline they sh should judge this right and especially currently everything is on demand everything happens when you want it you know you have instant gratification and there's no real patience currently in the world, right? Like most people don't have any patience. And um, when you mentioned this is something that most people haven't seen before, but combine that with no patience, right? That's why I think this argument also comes up a lot, right? Uh, it, uh, because as an answer to when someone says like Bitcoin is too volatile, then I also think, yeah, but what do you, what, what is the other side? Like, like, what do you expect from that? Like, what is the other side? Does something just get invented and then instant this is what it were this is what it's worth right like i i don't think it happens like like that how does it happen yeah we don't know right that's why it goes up and down and maybe yeah it, it, it takes we, we don't know how long it's gonna take so um yeah that's kind of how i sometimes view it like what, what do you think about that like that that short time frame basically that a lot of people Abs have absolutely yeah i think uh 
I mean, Seyfedean touches on this a lot, uh, just the idea that basically people have very uh, high time preferences right now. Um, they want instant gratification. We, 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 there's rampant cons consumerism present mm -hmm. in, in cultures around the world. Um, and yeah, to your point, uh, like something like this, something does not just become money overnight. Something doesn't even become an asset overnight. It takes time. It takes, especially with an emerging digital network, um, it's going to take time for people to kind of uh, place their trust in it. Um, I, so I, I remember reading one time that I think that like it's around 20 years after a digital network launches that people begin to think of it as being there forever. So we mm. passed that point a little while ago with the internet. Um, and most people believe that the internet is, is always going to be here. I think that's a pretty reasonable assumption. Um, and we're kind of nearing that point now with Bitcoin. Um, so as long as Bitcoin continues to function as intended, as it has for the last almost 15 years, um, I think people will, will place more confidence and bestow more trust in the protocol, in the network. Um, and uh, yeah, like that'll, that'll, that'll help drastically. Yeah. yeah. I think that coincides with a tweet I saw yesterday because I, yeah, that, that 20 years, right. Then there's grown ups, adults who have not lived in a world without Bitcoin, right? So it's always been exactly. there. Yeah. And, um, well, they probably won't have like, you know, the capital to, to buy it or whatever. Like they just know that it's, it has, has, has been there all their lives. Right. And then from there on, um, yeah, I also think that that adoption would be, um, yeah, not easier in a sense, but more people would probably be educated on it. Hopefully, more people, <laughs> the more people get educated on Bitcoin that are now uh, then are now educated in school on uh, economics in general, right? That, I uh, hope so. Yeah, <laughs> that we do, we don't learn a lot about. Yeah, no, oh, those those are those are very good points. Yeah, well, then then we don't really have to wait that long. Right, like in 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 five years, uh, we'll have uh, really like the first adults who who've never lived in the world without Bitcoin. So that's exciting. Um, totally. Third point about Bitcoin having no intrinsic value. Um, yeah, people often say this. But this is just the argument: is it has no intrinsic value? It comes from the air or nothing. Uh, I, I I think this is one of the weakest <laughs> myths, actually. How do you counter this when someone says this? Uh, and yeah, like particularly when people compare it to gold or real estate, diamonds, whatever. Yeah. So just to clarify, intrinsic value is basically the idea that an asset has some sort of inherent worth, um, usually associated with some sort of tangible qualities that it possesses. Uh, so take, for example, gold is a, is a great example. Uh, it has uses beyond its monetary uh uses. So it's used in jewelry, uh, it's used in industry, and it's also physical. So people are, you know, gold has intrinsic value. And I think this, this argument that Bitcoin does not have intrinsic value comes a lot from like gold bugs and things like that, mm -hmm. um, who feel that for something to have intrinsic value, it needs to have tangible qualities, it needs to have a tangible backing. And so because is, Bitcoin is, 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 is that it? Or is it sometimes I understood it as you know, gold gets formed underground by lots of pressure and whatever, you know, like stuff happens, energy is expended, etc. I know this is short leap to Bitcoin mining, but you know, <laughs> I, I, I kind of understand it as that, right? Like something happened for gold to exist. Something happened for diamonds to exist. Someone built a house that now someone can live in. Is that the intrinsic value or? That, that also plays into it for sure. Okay. Um, yeah, and I mean, and you can kind of say the same thing about Bitcoin mining in a way, but I won't even go there yet. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think also it's it's important to to kind of um, think realize that that intrinsic value comes in, in many forms, and that is because really value is is subjective, right? So I think in the article I quoted Mises, and he says, value is not intrinsic; it's not within things; it is within ourselves. It's in the way in which man reacts to the conditions of his environment. And that just kind of underpins the idea that value is subjective. People value things differently based on their own preferences, needs, and life experiences. Um, so for someone to say that Bitcoin doesn't have intrinsic value is sort of to like heighten their own preferences over someone else's. Um, and when you think about it, while Bitcoin is not physical, it, uh, it derives value and, and intrinsic value in its own way, in its own way. And the ways that it does that is through its, its, um, the way it was a technological innovation. 
um, through its scarcity of having only 21 million coins, as well as through its network effects and the, like, the real world utility that it possesses. So the ability for Bitcoin to be sent anywhere in the world um, at very low cost, almost instantly, is that's a very valuable service. I mean, we yeah. have entire industries built around just doing that, but Bitcoin literally just obsoletes those things. Um, and then you, when you consider also like the the, the growing network um, and the network effect that Bitcoin has, where the more people using Bitcoin, the more valuable it becomes, the more merchants accepting Bitcoin, the more easy it is to use your Bitcoin to spend on goods and services. Um, and yeah, so those those things combined kind of solidify the idea that Bitcoin does indeed have value. It has um, uh, it has real world utility, um, kind of challenging that that conception that it has no solid yeah. backing or intrinsic value. Again, here, I think this is such a simplification of this entire argument, this entire uh, well, myth is, is like an oversimplification of what Bitcoin actually is, right? Because as you mentioned, you can send Bitcoin anywhere in the world. It's decentralized. It solves a crazy old problem and the Byzantine general problem. And actually just how the technology is configured does already imply intrinsic value in a sense, right? Because we can do things that we weren't able to do before, which kind of sounds like intrinsic value in a sense, like it has value. It's not a random thing, right? It's not a, yeah, it's not a random, it's not a random thing. Yeah. Interesting. Again, like I, I, uh, that's again, like, I think this is a good episode, right? Like I always kind of chuckle when I see oversimplification of Bitcoin and then used as an argument in a sense that just really signals that you did not do the work, you know, like you do, you, you do not understand what this, what this actually is. Yeah. And I think another really good point too, is like for the people who say Bitcoin has no value, you got to ask yourself, you know, what about the hundred million people who are using Bitcoin? right like yeah do those what what is it that those people are valuing what do they see in bitcoin because clearly maybe you don't value bitcoin but others are and there are an increasing number of people who are valuing bitcoin from individuals to institutions to even yeah. nation states right so yeah you kind of got to ask yourself like what do they see in bitcoin and when you ask yourself that yeah. and then you do the research you realize like wait a minute, this is a, this yeah. is a breakthrough technology, <laughs> this has here. value, there's well, something here, exactly. Well, it goes back to what, uh, what I just said, right? Like it, it should, uh, and, and what you just say now, right? Like it should spark something in you, right? Like it, it's, uh, I, I, I've always been super intrigued in like technology and like startups, people building new businesses. And what I always thought was like judging like seeing an idea or a concept and saying, oh, this sucks or this could never work or this is so stupid, you know, like that it, it, it's simple and lazy to do that because if someone is working on something or a hundred million people are adopting something and, uh, you know, sharing information about it and trying to educate other people, there is something there because they are spending their, uh, their energy, their time, maybe their money on actually, you know, working on that idea or contributing to that idea right so i always thought well if i think something is stupid but there's three people in a team working on an idea they see something that i don't see maybe i'm right but they are still working on it right so i sh I, I i want to understand what they see and then i can actually have an opinion right then i have my own idea and then i hear how they see it and and then i can have actually a, a better opinion on you know whatever whatever the subject is here but yeah i i, I think it's the same here right like uh when when people are so are simplifying all these arguments um i don't think it's bad faith i think it's also sometimes maybe a bit daunting right like bitcoin is just hard to understand there's a lot of yeah. <laughs> dimensions that it touches right um and and one of, one of those things is you know what you think you know about money and economics and finance and you know, so it's also, I, I think, uh, yeah, not only daunting, but it also challenges your narrative and that's, uh, that could be scary also. Yeah. Okay. Well, the next one is Bitcoin is bad for the environment. I think this is the biggest. <laughs> it, it is indeed is probably, the biggest This is probably one, yeah. the biggest. And, and I think between when you wrote your article and now a lot has changed. Um, 
there have been KPMG uh, uh, reports on um, the ESG uh, aspect of Bitcoin. Uh, I, I mentioned Daniel Batten before on Twitter, who has like a big fund investing in, uh, I think it's a, a methane flaring and um, lowering emissions from landfills using Bitcoin mining. And he has amazing tweets and stats uh, on this. So a lot has changed since you, since you wrote about it. Um, what we see is that Bitcoin is increasingly powered by sustainable energy uh, or making use of other, uh, otherwise, you know, wasted uh, resources. Um, can you elaborate on this? Like, what is this trend? Where, where is it at? Like, how is it growing? And why could this make Bitcoin one of the cleanest industries on the planet? Yeah, totally. Um, <clears throat> so I think there is sort of this, um, there's an, there was, there was this narrative growing. I think it came a lot from like legacy media, uh, that Bitcoin is bad for the environment where they try to paint Bitcoin mining as sort of a black and white issue. Of course, nothing in, nothing in the world is that simple. So when you start doing some more research, you realize that right. there's a much more nuanced reality around Bitcoin. Um, so just because Bitcoin uses a lot of energy does not necessarily mean that it is bad for the environment. Um, almost everything we do in our lives uses energy. Um, and so it, it's not a, it's not a, a valid criterion for deciding whether or not something is good or bad for the environment. Um, so when you look into it, I'll just kind of knock off a couple facts to start here. Um, Go for it. yeah. So for starters, uh, according to the, the Cambridge Bitcoin electricity consumption index, uh, Bitcoin consumes about 0.2% of global energy production on an annual basis. So it's a, a pretty, pretty small. Uh, amount of energy in the grand scheme of things. Um, it's it's Same on as par. tumble dryers. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So it's, <laughs> yeah. it's on par with tumble dryers in the US alone. So mm. just in the USA, it uses about the same amount of as as tumble dryers, um, which is a, a very minuscule wild um, actually. Don't yeah, you well, think? clearly tumble dryers <laughs> use more energy than I realized. Yeah. But, um, you know, yeah, a lot of same. places kind of, uh, they like to make comparisons to countries, which is just not uh, a good comparison at all. It's not really mm. fair. Countries are made up of, of millions, of millions, and sometimes billions of people. Yeah, and, and also kind of this notion that energy is bad, mm -hmm. right? Like every, I once heard someone say, look outside, and then everything you see is made by energy, everything from the trees to the bricks to the, the just everything costs energy. And that's also the entire point about money, right? Yeah. It's to exchange energy with uh, energy with each other. Totally. Yeah. Well, like, yeah, every, everything is, everything is, is made from energy. Everything is energy. Energy is the, the key to, to human flourishment. Right. I, I don't know you've probably seen that chart where it's like, there's no such thing as an, uh, energy poor country where like, if yeah. you, if you are developing as a country, you are an energy rich country. And that's, there's a, yeah. there's a very tight correlation between development and energy usage. Um, yeah, so 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 Bitcoin uses a, a pretty small amount of energy in the grand scheme of things in the world. Um, it is also, like you were saying, powered by a majority of sustainable energy already. Um, and this this number is something I, it has been increasing, and something I do expect to increase uh, as time goes on. Um, and as you were saying, Daniel Batten is a is a climate VC and, and Bitcoin advocate, and he so one of his his recent research found that fifty two point six percent of all Bitcoin mining is being done susta with sustainable energy. Um, I think the Bitcoin mining council also has a report, uh, that finds around 60% as well. Mm -hmm. So I mean, somewhere in that range of, of 50 to 60% of all Bitcoin mining is being done with sustainable energy, uh, which is actually higher than almost most industries in the world. Um, so even though Bitcoin is a very new technology mm -hmm. and coming onto the scene just now, it's already using more sustainable energy than, than most other industries. And then the even more stunning part, uh, and this is more, again, shout out to Daniel Batten for this one. Um, he, he did a, it, a report with Willy Woo, um, and they found that over the last three years, the emissions intensity of the Bitcoin network has fallen by over 50%. And what's really stunning about this is that the emissions intensity of Bitcoin mining is falling while the network is growing and scaling. And yes, there are, this was I an argument I, before. Yeah. So I can't think yeah. of any other industries that can make a claim like that. And the reason why this is happening is because Bitcoin miners are increasingly adopting renewable energy. They're, they're adopting uh, wasted energy and just sustainable energy sources in general. Why are they doing that? Because 
Bitcoin miner, Bitcoin mining is a very cost competitive industry. Uh, it necessitates access to, to, to low cost energy. Um, and that often comes in the form of intermittent renewables, uh, stranded renewable energy, um, as well as wasted energy, like things like, uh, flared gas from, from, from oil and gas operations, but also methane leaking from landfills and things like that. So Bitcoin miners are increasingly utilizing, um, sustainable energy sources to power their operations. Um, and I think this is really, uh, magnificent because it's completely absent of any regulatory requirement from anyone for them to do this. They're adopting this because basically they have an incentive to use renewable energy over yeah. fossil fuels. And that's because fossil fuels are typically too expensive for, for mining Bitcoin in most cases. That's uh, not always the case, but, um, it's kind of the reason why we're seeing a, a, such a, a large portion of it being done using sustainable energy. Yeah, I think it's amazing. I, I, I actually, I love this aspect of Bitcoin and, uh, and, and, and what I meant by it was the argument before that, well, if Bitcoin is going to grow, it's going to consume uh, all, all the energy of France or something. <laughs> I don't know. There was like this, this thing before, but it's actually really great to see that now that it's growing, that um it could actually be it's actually like on track to become the first carbon negative uh industry in the world and yeah what i love actually about bitcoin in general like we are going to talk about this for the next 40 years right so we are going to see this industry become carbon negative right and yeah i just cannot wait for that moment like i i, I also really wonder if satoshi thought about this before I don't I don't know like it's not really mentioned you know like in a white paper uh, but but just that in, the, the incentive for miners to find the cheapest energy kind of ish but not really you know but like this this kind of the second order effect uh of bitcoin that yeah I think it's just truly amazing and again you know if you listen to this and you think you are a progressive person <laughs> who loves the environment and the planet you should just really dive into this because it's actually pretty crazy it's um there's less emissions than the banking system right um and and all these other things that uh, most people would probably find um way more important currently you know if they're learning about bitcoin and so um no i think you i think you did a great job in, in explaining this and and again if people want to see numbers right they can look for what did you mention the cambridge uh, what's it called? Uh, point, yeah, Cambridge um, Bitcoin Electricity Consumption Index. Yeah. Yes. A long and, name. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and Google. Well, find Daniel Battle on Twitter. Shout out. Daniel yeah. Battle. And uh, and also the KPMG um, Bitcoin ESG um, report. If you ch type that in into Google, then uh, you will probably uh, find that. All right. Next myth: Bitcoin is anonymous and only used for illicit activities. Um, you describe Bitcoin transactions as pseudonymous um, uh, uh, rather than anonymous. Can you explain why this makes Bitcoin less suitable? Yeah. So, so basically, uh, there is that kind of that misconception that Bitcoin is anonymous. So, it would be a good tool for for criminals or for just for illicit activity in general. Um, but Bitcoin transactions are not anonymous; they are pseudonymous. And what this means is basically like your address for for both sending and receiving Bitcoin. Um, it serves as a custom identifier for you, but it does not have any of your personal information attached to it. Um, so you can kind of, I think a good comparison is like an email address, an email address that serves as a custom identifier for you, but it doesn't necessarily attach your, your personal details to it. You know, your email could address could be hello world at gmail.com. Right. Um, so for that, exactly. for, yeah. so that basically means that, uh, it, it's not anonymous, uh, for starters. Um, which means it's it's definitely not a great tool for illicit activity. Um, <laughs> and why is that? And it also has to do with the fact that the Bitcoin blockchain itself is very transparent. Um, so as we were saying before, the Bitcoin blockchain is basically a permanent record of all the Bitcoin transactions that have occurred and will occur. Um, so you would kind of be like leaving a, a paper trail of the transactions you made if you were conducting illicit activity. Um, and, you know, it, while it's still hard to associate an address with a specific individual, um, you know, there are additional investigative techniques that can put into play that allow people to kind of trace the flow of funds over time. Um, even still, I, I would like to emphasize 
even though it's undesirable for illicit activities, one of the things that Bitcoin does still have, despite this transparency and traceability, is that censorship and seizure resistance. So the Bitcoin network does not discriminate at all. So if you were to send through a transaction in any way, um, it's not going to stop that transaction, even if it's for an illicit use. It doesn't know the difference between you sending money for an illicit activity and you sending money home to your family in another country, right? Yeah. So in that sense, you could still use it in that way, but you'd be leaving a, a paper trail. And there are there are privacy tools that can be built on on top of it. And I, I do hope that privacy becomes a little something that we address more on Bitcoin. Um, but in general, that that transparency, that immutability of the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, paired with this pseudon and pseudonymity of 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 transactions, um, definitely doesn't make it the ideal tool for any kind of criminal activity. And we see that already. If you look at the data, like out of all cryptocurrency transactions, only 0.34% are estimated to be used for illicit activity. Whereas something like fiat cash is obviously a much preferred medium for conducting illicit activity. And why is that? Because cash is actually anonymous uh, and you can't trace the, the flow of it, right? So it's, yeah. it's you know, in-person transactions. There's no att attaching your identity to that piece of paper that you've handed to somebody else. And if you look at the data again, up to 5% of all uh, cash transactions in the US are, are used for illicit activity. So that's a significantly higher proportion than than with yeah. all of crypto, not just Bitcoin. Yeah. Great you got that percentage. I was uh, I was Googling real quick to, <laughs> to see if I could find it. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And, and especially like you now have firms as, um, what's it called? Chain, um, chain analysis, for mm -hmm. example. They work with public and private uh, organizations uh, to do research on blockchain and tech um, wallets, uh, tech transactions, and monitor just um, yeah known criminal uh, criminal wallets, for example, for people who uh, are hackers. You know, with these uh, attacks where you know the BitLocker attacks where people have to buy Bitcoin to unlock their computers and stuff like that. So um, yeah, you can do it. Uh, as you mentioned, but uh, yeah, it's probably not the smartest or the the best thing that <laughs> that you could use. Where do you actually think this myth came from? Is that just Silk Road legacy? Uh, yeah, I'm actually I'm not sure where it came from, but I just hear it a lot. Yeah, so a lot of these myths are kind of just like I base this off of what I heard in both like legacy media as well as just word of mouth and, and talking to people that were. Um, like didn't know a lot about Bitcoin and the, the concerns they have right off the bat. I, I honestly think it's kind of like a false narrative that got spread around in the early days of Bitcoin, mm -hmm. um, probably associated with like the Silk Road with Silk Road and things like that. I mean, yeah, so not 100% sure of the origin, but yeah, yeah, it's it's probably that I think that's just also one of the things how Bitcoin got known, right? Yeah, um, yeah exactly. And uh, to more more broader public, yeah. All right, next one is Bitcoin will be hacked or shut down. And you say that due to Bitcoin's decentralized nature and the security it makes it resistant to hacking. What, what are, how does this contribute to uh, its resilience and are there any other things? Yeah, so a lot of people, um, because Bitcoin, is, as we were kind of touching on, like it's a, it's a relatively new digital network. Um, so people aren't necessarily sure about its permanence yet. Um, and they think that it'll like, because it's digital, uh, it might, it can get hacked. Um, and that's something that kind of stems from the fact that a lot of digital products can be hacked, um, as well as the idea that, you know, like governments are, are going to ban Bitcoin or something like that. Um, and really governments can only ban themselves from, from Bitcoin. They can't actually ban Bitcoin itself. And the reason for that is because, well, one Bitcoin is a decentralized network. So there is, there are people. Um, what we call nodes, uh, running the Bitcoin software in all corners of the world. And there are also people mining Bitcoin in all the corners of the world. Um, and these people running the Bitcoin net software um, are, are all keeping a separate version of the Bitcoin ledger right there on their computer. Um, and they're verifying it every 10 minutes as new blocks come in. Um, and the, the beauty of this is that like you could have a nation state um, ban Bitcoin and say, you know, like, you can't mine here, you can't run the Bitcoin software, if mm -hmm. like, that would be extremely difficult to enforce, of course. But even if somewhere that happened, like say somewhere in the US, and you know, Bitcoin just went dark in the US, um, 
the network itself would continue to function as intended pretty much perfectly. Like obviously the hash rate would take a little bit of a hit, um, but because there are nodes everywhere else in the world, the, the Bitcoin network continues to function. Uh, so it would take like widespread uh, blackout to be actually able to affect the, the network. Um, but even in that case, like, you know, I've seen people broadcasting. Bitcoin oh, if there's two nodes, two nodes, radio. there's even yeah, satellite. Exactly. Like there's it, even it, satellite nodes, right? Yeah, exactly. So we have, we have Bitcoin in space on satellites. We have Bitcoin that's yeah. being sent over radio. We have Bitcoin on the internet. Like, like the internet is just the most efficient way to use Bitcoin. It's not necessarily attached to the internet or, or reliant on the internet in any way. I mean, you can yeah. actually like create a wallet and mine Bitcoin using pen and paper if you wanted to, which is exactly. totally crazy to think about. Um, and then the other thing too is is the idea that Bitcoin would, can be hacked. Um, and that to me is is technically infeasible. Um, why is that? Because Bitcoin is one, decentralized, two, uses some of the most advanced cryptography that we know, as well as just the immense amount of computational power backing the network. So um, if people aren't familiar, uh, one, of the, one of the things people say is like a call the 51% attack, and that would basically involve harnessing uh, a majority of the network's computing power um, to, to, to uh, conduct faulty transactions or get some more Bitcoin for yourself. But uh, what, what you realize is that, that at this point um, is pretty much impossible, given that how decentralized the multi uh, Bitcoin billion mining, dollar, yeah, and uh, how much uh, that, yeah. that energy backing the network um, and is, is quite immense. Um, so, so people kind of realize like, and, and it would have been easier, right? If, if, if Bitcoin was going to be hacked, it would have already happened every day. It becomes increasingly harder, uh, to hack, um, and, and more secure. And I think that that kind of is, it's a, it's a thing of beauty. Um, yeah. 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 I, I, I once saw a video by, uh, Andreas Antonopoulos. I, I think it's probably like over eight years ago or something where he explains that even back at that moment, um, an attack, as you mentioned, it, it was already a multi-billion dollar uh, endeavor. Um, and even when you would be able to do it. So now it's in increasingly more. I wonder if there, there's actually like numbers out there, right? If people could actually calculate like what it, what it would take. Um, yeah. But even when you would have like more control over the network, there's only... Um, 10 minutes actually in in which you could make money right um because it will be noticed very quickly and then you would be locked out th that node from which you are basically you know or the nodes uh, from which you are basically attacking the network they would be excluded by all the uh, people that are not part of the of the attack which is the majority again right so um yeah you would just be ignored basically and um yeah so so there like an attack yeah what what would even be an attack right you cannot take it down you cannot hack it yeah you can have some fake transactions yes you will steal something but actually if the network then forks right and you are excluded then yeah there's nothing Your assets there's no problem worthless. There, yeah. There, yeah there's not even a problem yeah and and actually uh, uh while you're talking i i googled like what's the size of the blockchain it's only 15 gigabytes and actually, also while we're talking, I was thinking, what is just so amazing about Bitcoin? It's just code. It's just code. It's ones and zeros. Like the 15 gigabytes is text. It's mm -hmm. literal text. It's just text, right? It's just a chain of text. And it's funny, like sometimes I have these moments in Bitcoin where I think like, wow, that's actually pretty insane, <laughs> right? That is just text. And also I sometimes, um, I, I, I heard people say like Bi Bitcoin is actually freedom of speech. Like even, even if you have, because text and creative expression or, you know, a thought in your head, uh, which could be your private key is just free speech, right? So how, how could you even ban that or shut that down? Like, it's just, it's just not, it's just totally impossible. You can't, yeah. Yeah. It's totally yeah. impossible. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not great, afraid to say great realization. <laughs> yeah, no, it's totally yeah. impossible. Yeah. And it would be, it's actually like one of the, 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 the things about the rules in Bitcoin, right? It's like follow the rules instead of rulers, how we follow rulers now. Right. And everyone who wants to use Bitcoin, they can say, they can see the rules. They can see how everyone else is playing by the rules. They can, they can see anything. And the most important thing is that when you want to play in Bitcoin, you have to play according to the rules. 
and you have to also show everything, right? So you it's forced transparency um, on the base layer and then every everything that's built on top. And I think for me, that's one of the things, you know, when we talk about hacking or shutting down or, you know, it's, it's also better to play by the rules than actually try to bend the rules or, um, you know, um, try to misuse the rules or, or, or change them or whatever. Like, it's just... It's just easier to play along, right? And and same for countries, you know, as you mentioned, it's just the entire endeavor of trying to kill Bitcoin is super futile. Like, makes no makes no sense. Yeah, exactly. Like the the incentives of the network itself uh, encourage you to play by the rules instead of yeah. using that that computational power that you got to try to 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 mess with the Bitcoin network. What you should do instead is dedicate that to playing by the rules of the network and get some coins for yourself, right? Like, so the, yeah. it has like this sort of like economic incentive to, to play by the rules yeah. and to actually not hack the network because you would be more beneficial for you to play by the exactly. rules and yeah, just mine some just Bitcoin. Really... Yeah. And you know what? Like, I, I would say like, who who would be able to to try to stage an attack, right? Like that's, well, it's by now it's nation states. Think about what 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 would the PR value be in legitimizing Bitcoin if someone would, if there would be like a nation state attack attempt on Bitcoin. Like in my mind, that legitimizes this as a thing, right? Like as a, it's a legit threat to a current system or whatever the argument is actually for for attacking Bitcoin in that sense. But for me, it would be like the ultra legitimization of Bitcoin as a whole. Yeah, literally. <laughs> mm. Well, let's see. Let's see if that would happen any any day. Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't think it would ever happen. Yeah, I don't as think well. so either. <laughs> All right. So, last myth is Bitcoin is a bubble. I think for me, the one about the environment and the bubble <laughs> are the biggest <laughs> ones that I hear. Um, yeah, you mentioned labeling Bitcoin as a as a bubble. Yeah, again, it's like a over simplification of how it works and and how it's growing in adoption. Um, how how is it not a bubble and how does it set it apart from actual bubbles? Yeah. Well, so when the idea of a bubble is basically that uh, an asset or in finance, at least, would be the idea that the value of the asset is inflated well beyond its intrinsic worth. Um, and so, you know, many people will, will call Bitcoin a bubble uh, because it kind of it's still very new. They'll compare it to the tulip mania at the end of the Dutch Golden Age in 1634, where tulips became, you know, a very highly valued commodity um, and then came crashing down a couple of years later. Um, but I think that kind of so labeling Bitcoin as a bubble sort of oversimplifies it. It's the growing technology underneath it and like the way that it works. Um, so and I think also one thing that that draws people to saying it's a bubble is because of these big uh, run ups in price. So like, you know, mm -hmm. going from twenty thousand dollars to to almost seventy thousand dollars US uh, in twenty twenty one, like to that that amount of appreciation makes people kind of think, oh, this is a bubble. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's not. Um, and why is that? Because what we've seen throughout Bitcoin's 14 year existence is these big run-ups in price and then a price correction as it goes back down. But what it keeps doing is it every time it's, it is, even though it's crashing, it consistently recovers and makes a new all time high in the next cycle. Um, and that kind of just highlights like that, that the underlying network that is, that is Bitcoin. And it's not just, uh, it's not just like this, this artificially inflated asset. Yeah, uh, by any means. Or yeah, something. exactly. Yeah. It's 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 a reflection of the fact that the network is growing, that there are more investors involved in it, that they're like, yeah, like the the asset itself is is maturing and becoming more relevant in the in the on the global stage, um, and and that's just going to continue to happen. And I, you know, probably over the next few years, probably honestly, when when we make the next all time high, uh, I think people will kind of realize that Bitcoin is here to stay. Um, that it, that it's not a bubble. It wasn't a bubble when it made it to seventy thousand. It's not going to be a bubble when it breaks through a hundred thousand. Um, and yeah, so I think it's kind of just one of those things that's just going to take time. Um, but once you understand, like you know, how Bitcoin works, the decentralization of it, um, its inherent scarcity, its growing network effects, uh, you know, it, it's it's a revolutionary technology. It's it's not a bubble. I mean, 
if you want yeah. to talk about bubbles, we can we can talk about a lot of different financial assets <laughs> in the world right now. Uh, I mean, I'm living in Canada, and I mean, we're we have what I would argue is probably one of the the largest housing bubbles uh, the country has ever seen uh, since I was born. Mm. Housing prices have increased over four hundred percent, which is obviously completely. Uh, detached yeah, from it, their there intrinsic value. Uh, are there four hundred percent more people who no, value a house? And... <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I mean, we know our our population is growing, but we're a pretty small country in general. Um, <laughs> yeah. But the, like the really the the pressing thing is that our incomes aren't growing at that speed, right? So so there's a there's a divergence between the the average income that that a Canadian is earning and the and the cost of buying a house. So it becomes increasingly more difficult for for people to buy houses here in Canada, especially if you're if you're part of Gen Z. And this is something I, I talk about quite a bit. Um, and it's like so the question is, like, why why is this happening? And, and in large part, it's being driven by uh, like the the financialization of real estate um, mm -hmm. because our money is constantly losing value. Investors and just people in general need a place to store their wealth for the long term um, because they can't just hold Canadian dollars or, or U.S. dollars because those those are basically you can kind of think of it like holding a bag with a hole in it. They're constantly losing value to inflation. And so holding a large amount of wealth in 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 fiat currency um, is a guaranteed way to lose money. So what do people do? They invest in assets. They invest in the S&P. They invest in houses. Um, especially housing, real estate has been, must be like probably the most popular way to store wealth over the long term, mm -hmm. And that's why we've kind of seen these, these massive run-ups in price, right? It's, it's basically being driven by this, this preference for long-term wealth storage because of the inflation that, that is present over a long time yeah. and as well as yeah. short periods like we've seen in this last couple of years. Yeah. Do you also feel that this like bubble argument for Bitcoin is also, again, it's like this super dismissive. E, e, um, it's just a weak dismissive argument in a sense, right? It's uh, for me when someone says that it also really signals like I don't really want to study this. I just assume that it's nothing uh, or it's bad or something, and then I'm just not going to study it. But I'm still, you know, I'm still going to say it's a, it's a bubble. I think, especially for this, you know, combined with what you mentioned before, like the price discovery of a new asset that that no one has actually ever you know experienced and witnessed uh before like you you have to try and it i i i also find it hard right to to go to some sort of more like uh, meta level you know like just higher than your own position or or your community or whatever like it's 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 about something that is uh way 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 bigger and that you just don't really understand right like the same as um or when they say like the price goes up and then maybe it's too much or oh, then we call it a bubble but yeah you you don't well nowadays okay you hear more people talk about like a housing bubble right but if you look up like what is the total value of real estate in the world i don't i think it's 300 million if i say correctly it's like, like that's 400 trillion i think if oh, i'm sorry mistaken. did i say trillion did you, I say... you said million but that's okay oh no yeah, <laughs> yeah it's trillion. like somewhere yeah. between 300 it, and 400 but that trillion, number yeah. is just unfathomable Right, like how you you like we don't understand. We cannot our, wrap our yeah, brains our around. Our brains it, cannot, right? uh, yeah, exactly. Comprehend numbers that large, uh, which is a lot exactly. of time. I love those kind of visualization photos <laughs> yeah. of like you know dollar bills stacked, you know, a hundred stacks as tall as the, yeah, the Statue have, of like, Liberty blocks, around. Right? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Like... <laughs> or like a million seconds is eleven days, and uh, yeah, a billion yeah. seconds is thirty-two years, and a trillion seconds yeah, is thirty-two thousand years. <laughs> Wow, you know, so that helps put and, it in perspective. And, and 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 yeah, to come back to my point, like the dismissive part is just it's just not that simple, you know. Like understanding this is really hard, or understanding trying to understand finance and economics, and it's just really hard, you know. So again, I think because this was also the last myth, you know, that 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 you talk about in your article, I I feel in general that most of them are. Yeah, kind of like e easy dis dismissals of what Bitcoin is. You know, uh, I, I think you made great points about, you know, showing that it's not as black and white. You know, obviously, <laughs> I, I fully agree, but I, I think it's something and especially nowadays that a lot of people think it's left or right or yes or no or good or bad or whatever, like uh, something like this. And especially because this touches, 
yeah, again, so many dimensions uh, and also a core of what most people think about probably on a daily or weekly basis, which is money. It's just a really hard subject, you know, to understand. But uh, yeah, I, th I think you did great. What are some arg counter arguments that you hear against your points? Have you, have you heard them and how, how do you address them? There are there are very few uh, counter arguments that I've encountered with that like kind of hold their veracity, especially yeah. against all like the points that we kind of made here. Um, I think some of them are more like things that I can just understand. Like we were talking about like the volatility, for example, I can mm. I can absolutely understand investors not wanting to have their wealth fluctuate that much. Um, but uh, like like we said, that's not an intrinsic characteristic of the technology, but rather just the young and evolving nature of Bitcoin. Um, I think that a lot of the time, uh, sometimes we get a little ahead of ourselves on certain things and we, we base, um, we talk a lot of like in like kind of future speculation of, of what Bitcoin will do, um, or w what it can do, um, which can get a little carried away, uh, a little bit. Um, I mean, anything is possible, right. And Bitcoin is, is demonstrating remarkable, uh, resilience and, and growth and, and just emerging with so many like real world use cases. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure there's like any specific arguments. <laughs> How about you? Have you encountered any sort of like really good arguments against it? Yeah, there's the whole uh, like actually, deflation yeah. thing, I guess. Um, but uh, I personally, I, I don't believe that. I don't think uh, like deflation no. is necessarily as bad as people make it out to be. Um, no, I agree. I actually had um, a uh, conversation today about Bitcoin with two people who both own Bitcoin, but they were both like, uh, you know, very, very small percentage of, of their, um, of their wealth. And they, we were talking about, and they were asking like, okay, how, uh, you know, these are the things that kind of hold me back from, um, allocating more. Right. And I, I think we touched on a few of these myths actually. And I also try to kind of like, uh, you know, disprove them and we talked about it, but it's just, it's really, and, and then they say like, well, yeah, I could go along with this, but you know, like, so it's still, I, I don't think it's, it's, well, I hope this podcast would, will be for a lot of people, but it's, it's, it's hard to dismiss these things in like one conversation, right? So you can even hear this as you explained it well in this episode, I think. But you still have to kind of like do your own research in a sense, right? Like, yeah, it, well, maybe some people will think like, well, what uh, Brad Mersek says, uh, I'm just going <laughs> to adopt that and then I'm going uh, full into Bitcoin. I, I, I don't think that's going to happen, right? So you still have to do your own work in a sense and, and yeah, challenge your own, own beliefs. Um, um, but no, I, yeah, so back to that conversation, like, I, yeah, they had like these general, general counter feelings i almost want to say right um yeah in the future it could be this or that or xyz and then i say yeah but that's a feel a lot of that stuff is kind of like a straw man in a sense right it, it could go bad because something something yeah you know a lot of ifs and yeah yeah ifs yeah. buts when mm -hmm. yeah and and um so I, I i kind of try to steer like those conversations more towards um, you know, giving them some resources or things to read or to watch, like, you know, the, the, this is what turned on, you know, some lights and switches in my head um, that made me dive into this more. Um, yeah, but yeah, I also have not really seen any good counter arguments in general, also not on Twitter from, you know, all these uh, critics or even someone like Peter Schiff or something, you know, like that. Yeah, it just sounds like an angry old man. Like there's no real debate, you know, yeah. and it's just, <laughs> it's just hating in a sense. And then I think like, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I pity that uh, as kind of what I mentioned before, right? Like if there's so many people, um, very, very smart people, actually every day I see, I see people that, well, every day I almost get my mind blown in a sense of just how intelligent people are in Bitcoin and how they look at things and share, you know, and then, yeah, if someone like Peter Schiff, well, uh, for people listening, is like a, apparently a famous gold investor or something. I don't know. He's just always screaming like all these Bitcoin idiots and blah, blah, blah. 
I don't know, like I kind of pity that, right? Like I don't really care what he does with gold, right? Like why would we scream about oh gold sucks or something? I don't I don't know enough about gold to even say that. So yeah, why you know why would yeah. I even do that? So yeah, I don't know. Yeah, again, like I pity that a bit. He so, gets yeah. he gets a lot of engagement from the Bitcoin content. Uh, if you like look at at the tweets where he's like criticizing Bitcoin, they are like you know twice as many views, likes, and engagements than anything else that he tweets. So like he's probably doing that to just like broaden his audience um but yeah like i, I like you were saying like i, I definitely yeah, that, encourage that, that actually makes me pity it more <laughs> yeah you know yeah, well uh, yeah yeah totally yeah and I uh think, yeah. yeah no go but, ahead yeah i think the most important thing like for anybody watching is yeah do your do your own research uh and, and come to your, your own conclusions um i mean this was sort of one of the reasons i i started writing uh my newsletter in general was because I just saw so much, so much misinformation swirling around. Um, and I really wanted to just like kind of cut, cut through that and provide like clear, concise facts instead of, um, just a lot of, of wishy-washy misinformation and, and competing narratives and stuff like that. And it also, it was a way as like, I knew that, um, a lot of my friends and family were not going to be, uh, you know, tuning into to Bitcoin podcasts or reading Bitcoin books, but they might actually, <laughs> yeah. you know, read, read the newsletter that I'm writing about this, realize that I'm, I'm taking yeah. this very seriously. Um, and I hope that they can, they take it seriously as well. Um, because like, and particularly this article, Bitcoin myths, um, like I, I wrote it in the hope that, people realize that this, like we were saying, is not a not a black and white issue at all. Bitcoin is not black and white. It is a very new, innovative and breakthrough technology that's going to change so many of the ways that we interact with the world and, and our economic systems. And it has so many benefits, um, When you, whether you're thinking about economic benefits, social benefits, environmental benefits, it, it touches all of these areas of our lives. And that's because money is, is one of the most important things that we use right um like it it forms the foundation of all savings and trade and investment and that that there kind of like from there influences so many different aspects of our lives that it's so subtle it's so it's so deep that people don't even realize it right and we don't think about the money that we use but when you start to think about the money that we use and the possibility for bitcoin to serve as a new form of money that we use and returning to the to sound money to hard money money free from inflation and what that means for our current systems and how we interact with the world and the problems we're facing. Um, it's, it's immensely powerful and it's, it's an incredibly rewarding journey. So I, I encourage anyone watching to, to really, to do their own research and, and look more into Bitcoin because this is, uh, it's not going anywhere. Awesome, man. I love that. I have, I have two final questions. Are there any myths between when you wrote this article and now that, came up that you think are worth mentioning um, not really are there are there any ones that you kind of you were getting that that i didn't touch on i'm i'm curious honestly if i missed any important ones <laughs> i wrote down the question but i didn't think about it myself <laughs> um well I, I I I do think there's people who say like, oh, there's not enough, you know, there's only mm. 21 million. Um, I think we need to tell pe more people that you can, uh, you know, it's it's divisible by 100 million. Per exactly. Bitcoin. Yeah. And I don't know the exact numbers, but I once read an article that that it could have like some parity being like one one set, you know, the the smallest um, like one 100 million of a Bitcoin. Um, if that's one cent, it would still, uh, it would work basically, uh, as a, as a money. Um, I think that's like the main, the, 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 maybe the one extra thing, but I, I think in general, it's the ones you, uh, you touched upon, right? Uh, yeah. e even today, uh, it's a, it's a bubble. Do you still think it could be higher or whatever? Like people... Uh, and the environment one, I think, uh, for me again, like those are the main ones that that um, that I hear. Yeah, um, yeah. So last question, I ask everyone the same question: What's a, what's a core belief you will never let go? A core belief I will never let go. Man, I wish I had <laughs> thought about this before. <laughs> everyone has to think about this. Yeah. Um, I guess freedom of choice and expression. I think that that is like 
at the core of a, a, a peaceful and civilized society. Uh, and I think that's also really reinforced by Bitcoin and like, like the idea of really strong property rights and things like that, because that, that, that kind of builds the, the basis for functioning, a functioning economy. And, and as someone who kind of views the world, um, through the world of economics and through the, the, like a very monetary lens, I believe like the, the economic system we use just is, is so important in our day-to-day -day lives that, um, using the best system possible is, is extremely important. Awesome. Well, thanks for busting Bitcoin myths here. Um, My where pleasure. can people <laughs> find you online? Where can they follow yeah, you totally. and, and so, your stuff? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm on Twitter a lot, uh, at Zach Gennard, um, or just Zach G, uh, you'll find me on there tweeting quite a bit, uh, as well as, um, my newsletter through Substack, which is called the Bitconomist. Um, those are mainly the two, the two places Twitter. I use mostly for like short form stuff. And then anytime I want to write like a more lengthy article touching on topics within Bitcoin and economics, it goes right onto my Substack. Um, so either of those are, are great places to, to keep in touch and, and see the work that I'm doing. Awesome. I will link to your uh, Twitter X profile uh, and uh, and Substack in uh, in the show notes. Uh, thanks again for coming on, and uh, yeah, let's stay in touch and uh, and do this sometime again uh, uh, in the future. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review, and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.